We wish to call to your attention that Manhattan Mother, sponsored by the makers of Chipso, usually heard at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time, will be presented a half hour earlier at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, beginning Monday, September 25th. In a few minutes, we will take you to Washington for the proceedings at the historic special session of Congress. The President of the United States will address a joint session of Congress in person on the issue of the neutrality law. But first, here is the latest news from other parts of the world, news which occurred while Congress gathered into special session. Close attention is directed at Romania today. There, the Premier, Arman Kalinescu, has been assassinated. This led to reports that important developments, perhaps of a revolutionary nature, are underway in the Romanian capital, Bucharest. But up to this moment, there is nothing to bear out those reports. Filing its news under a Bucharest dateline, the United Press said that six youthful assassins shot and killed Premier Kalinescu, who was a vigorous foe of the pro-Nazi Iron Guard. The killing took place while the Premier was, dri was driving by automobile to the Royal Palace, where it was believed he was to have an interview with King Carol. The government of Romania, headed by Premier Kalinescu, has suppressed the Iron Guard organization on charges of terrorism. The dispatch from Bucharest goes on. The assassins approached Kalinescu's automobile from behind a parked car on the main street of Bucharest. The Premier's automobile was blocked for the moment, either by accident or intentionally, by a large truck. The truck lumbered across the street, blocking a line of traffic. The Premier's automobile slowed down. The six assassins leaped from their hiding place and ran toward it. One of them yanked open the door of the car. Then the shots were fired. Kalinescu was taken to the nearby university hospital and pronounced dead. And a few seconds later, the Bucharest radio station interrupted a musical program and a voice shouted, Kalinescu is killed. And now the very latest word from Bucharest file just nine minutes ago said that two of the assassins of the premier committed suicide by shooting tonight in Bucharest when they were surrounded in a midtown store. Guards cut off their escape. There is no word yet about the other attackers and a clear picture as to whether this is an isolated attack or the forerunner of other events is not available. Briefly now the news of other capitals. London published a white paper in which it is stated that Germany answered Great Britain's ultimatum on September the 2nd, an ultimatum which, you remember, demanded withdrawal of Nazi troops from Poland with a threat to answer any aggressive action on the part of England with the same weapons and in the same form. Berlin said today that Soviet War Commissar Borisilov may visit the German capital early in October to return the visit of a German military mission to Moscow. There is no confirmation from Russia about this so far. Five announced today that all details of its general mobilization are complete, meaning that six million men are under arms and ready for their war duties. It was also stated that British preparations in France are proceeding on a large scale. The French said that Allied aircraft shot down two German planes and that Captain von Richthofen, son of the World War ace, had been killed. It is stated that one-fifth of the German submarine fleet at sea has been destroyed. Further unconfirmed reports say that the liner Bremen is in British hands. Fighting still goes on in Poland. By all indications, up to this moment, Warsaw still holds out under heavy siege, but still holds out at that. The Poles say also that Lwów is holding out. And here in New York, stocks advanced fractions to five points in moderately active trading today, while bonds were mixed with 18 U.S. governments at new lows, and wheat gained one and one quarter and one and one half cents a bushel. More news as it occurs. For word from our own capital, we take you now to Washington. Washington, D.C., September 21st. The Congress of the United States convenes in extra session. This is John Charles Daly speaking from the House of Representatives, called into this session by the President of the United States by a proclamation issued on September 13th. Today at noon, the House of Representatives and the United States Senate met, organized, and recessed until 1.50 Eastern Standard Time, 2.50 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Then the Senate and the House will convene in joint session to hear the President of the United States deliver his message reviewing the neutrality laws of the country. Columbia's microphones will be opened on the rostrum of the House to bring you the address of the President. In the meantime, as we await the arrival of the President, Albert Warner, Columbia's Washington News Analyst, who is in the small library of the House, has several distinguished members of Congress whom he will interview. Albert Warner. 
One of the congressmen we have here is Senator Austin, assistant minority leader of the Senate who comes from rock-ribbed Republican Vermont. The senator was one of those invited to the president's conference yesterday on neutrality revision. Senator, can you tell us something about what you think is ahead in the session? Mr. Warner, the preservation of American institutions and peace is the immediate ob objective. The means to be used is the question. My judgment is that repeal of the embargo, leaving our government independent to take any action that may be adapted to known conditions in the future would be the most neutral act of government and therefore the least partial and the least provocative. Retention of the embargo is not regarded as impartial. It helps Germany. It deprives Britain and France of a lawful advantage they possess through geographical location and command of the seas. The distinction between neutrality and qualified neutrality ought to be regarded when we take our first step. Repeal of the embargo would place the government in a truly neutral attitude. Repeal of the embargo accompanied by reenactment of the cash and carry provision would place the government as such in an attitude of semi-neutrality. Only one step should now be taken. This is necessary for the record. This step should be entirely neutral and impartial. There is only one act within our contemplation which constitutes that step, and that is repeal of the Embargo Act of 1937. There we should stop for the present. There we would be under the rules of international law. These rules forbid the government participating for or against either side. These rules uh, do not require the government to prohibit its nationals from commerce. Later, if the circumstances should require some further act by the government, which is not wholly impartial, such as reenacting the cash and carry provision uh, covering both munitions and contraband of war, the government could take that step deliberately and candidly admit the fact that it is, its act is not entirely impartial. Therefore, I prefer the first alternative. However, I seek information and guidance and am particularly concerned that Congress should act in accord with an enlightened public opinion because the vitality of our foreign policy depends upon the support of a united people. I have voluminous mail on this subject for which I am grateful. I shall try to answer each letter with a view to encouraging continued interest and expression by the American people. Finally, the country should feel reassured by the knowledge that regardless of preferences respecting methods, we have a united Congress on the objective of peace. Thank you, Senator Austin. Now, Representative Bruce Barton, a Republican representing a district in the heart of Manhattan Island in New York City. You've just been on the floor, Mr. Barton. Can you tell us what the atmosphere in the House is? Well, I would say that the atmosphere in the House is profoundly serious and strikingly free from partisan thought or purpose. It seems to me that the members of Congress have come back to Washington with only one idea, and that is to arrive at an honorable and effective agreement which may save our people from the ravages and the heartbreak of another foreign war. I think no man who has the honor to occupy a seat in this Congress can fail to be impressed with the solemn character of this meeting. On September 3rd, less than three weeks ago, parliamentary government ceased to function in every great nation of the world with the single exception of the United States. The parliaments of England and France continued to convene, but only to register the, the decrees of what have now become virtually autocratic governments. No nation can successfully conduct a modern war without surrendering itself to autocracy. Thus, our Congress meeting today is the one last outpost of real representative government, the one free forum where men and women can express their convictions with no censorship. Nowhere else in the world is there left a national legislative body where the people can make their influence directly felt, that they are making it felt, that they propose to participate positively and continuously in the discussion is indicated by the mail that is flooding our offices. So great was the volume this morning that delivery was delayed more than an hour. Across the oceans, the decisions of life and death 
for the masses of men and women are being made by small groups of men behind closed doors. Here in America, and only in America, the people, through their Congress, in free and open meetings, argue their convictions and arrive finally at the united policy which becomes law. The Senate has just entered the House chamber. Now we'll have a word from Senator Burns, a Democratic leader from South Carolina. This Congress has been called not to consider the question of whether this government will go to war, but to consider neutrality legislation. I know of no man in public life holding responsible position who is not sincerely anxious to have the United States keep out of war. The question is how best to accomplish this objective. I favor the repeal of the embargo provision. I think that the people of America should have the right to sell the products of our farms and factories to Germany, Great Britain, or any other government provided they pay cash and carry home their purchases. I believe that in considering neutrality legislation, the Congress will approach it in an entirely nonpartisan manner. You can rest assured the Congress is actuated only by a desire to promote the best interest of the American people and keep this nation out of war. Thank you, Senator Byrne. And now, as the president is expected here in a few minutes, may I turn this over to Charles Daly. Here is what's been happening in the House of Representatives while Mr. Warner was interviewing the celebrities from the two houses of Congress. At approximately 1.55, Speaker Bankhead called the House to order, and then the Senate, preceded by Vice President Garner, the Secretary and Sergeant of Arms, entered the chamber. Now the... Speaker Bankhead and Vice President Ghana are seated together on the speaker's platform of the rostrum, and in a moment they will appoint committees to go out of the House to conduct the President into the chamber. Uh, speaker Bankhead and Vice President Ghana are consulting now uh, relative to the appointment of the committees, and the members of the Senate are taking their seats. The floor of the House is, as usual, the order ordered excitement that one expects to, in a joint session of the Congress, for the Senate will take up the first three rows of the regular House assigned seats, and then the House members are moved back and extra chairs put in back of the circular rows of seats that ordinarily suffice for the members of the House. Shortly, the President's Cabinet will be inducted into the chamber itself by Mr. Sinat, the House doorkeeper, and they will take their seats at the foot of the rostrum, the dais from which the President will speak. The Senate are still filing, the Senators are still filing into the House of Representatives and taking their proper places, and Senator Austin, who has just spoken to you, I can see now taking his seat. Senator Bankhead is in the process of naming committees. That was North Carolina, Mr. Dowden, that was from Massachusetts, Mr. Martin. The uh, Senate committee will be Mr. Barkley of Kentucky, Pittman of Nevada, Mr. McNary of Oregon. Vice President Garner, as you just heard, name the two committees that will go out and conduct the President of the United States into the House chamber so that he may make his address. Uh, in just a moment now, the doorkeeper, Mr. Sinat, will announce the President's cabinet, and they will file in and take their places in a row of armchairs that, as, as I have told you, have been placed at the foot of the regular line of seats. Now, Speaker Bankhead, I think, will make the announcement of the President's cabinet's entrance into the House chamber. Speaker Bankhead and Mr. Garner are consulting, I believe, on the order and precedence of this day. Now the members of the uh, President's Cabinet are coming into the House from one of the front doors beside the rostrum rather than the center door to which they're usually inducted. I can see Postmaster General Farley, Secretary of State Cordell Hull, Secretary Wallace of Agriculture, Madam Perkins, the Secretary of Labor, and they have all taken their places now and the Joint Committee will escort the president into the chamber in just a moment. Colonel Starling, the chief of the White House Secret Service, has been going up and down the corridor, which runs off this house library, and we can anticipate that the president will be here very shortly. This is the 25th time that Congress has had a special session since its organization 150 years ago. 
John Adams was the first president to call a special session. He summoned the Fifth Congress to meet on May 15th in 1797 to consider suspension of diplomatic relations with France. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison each found it necessary to call two extraordinary sessions. And Mr. Lincoln called another just before the Civil War. The greatest number of special sessions have been summoned by Woodrow Wilson and Franklin D. Roosevelt, three each. Mr. Roosevelt's first extraordinary session of Congress was in March of 1933 to pass emergency New Deal laws. The second was in October of 1937 to enact the social labor and farm legislation, and this special session that has convened today makes the third. Right now, the members of the House and the Senate are all sitting quietly in their seats. The galleries, as to, is to be expected, are filled to overflowing, and standees are standing at all of the doors. The presidential box is directly opposite us across the full length of the House, and it's very hard to recognize anybody sitting in the box from here, but we can see some of the presidential confidential secretaries, Miss Grace Tully, and I believe uh, Miss Lehand is up there too. Outside of that, all of the boxes, right up to the very edge of the standing room, are filled to overflowing, and although the scene is not as bright as it was on the occasion of the 150th anniversary of the Congress, last spring, the color is still there. The, there are many ladies in the audience, and they're all dressed in bright new autumn clothes. Colonel Starling, the chief of the White House Secret Service, has just come in the door immediately to the right of the rostrum and has spoken to some of the members of the Secret Service standing there. So we can expect now that the president will be here shortly. An hour before the scheduled convocation of Congress this morning and three hours before President Roosevelt's speech, vantage points up here in the galleries of the House where the joint session is to be held were taken over by newsreels and still cameramen. Even then, a few spectators with the coveted passes that entitled them to seats arrived. That was at 11 o'clock this morning. At that time, your reporter was here, and there were only two members on the floor itself, and they were Representatives Curtis and Graham. Both, incidentally, are among the few who have established perfect attendance records at the last session. Microphones were put in their places, and automobile parking in the plaza in front of the Capitol was banned. Two hours ago, also large crowds of spectators began to trek across the lawns and take up vantage points near the entrance to the House so that they might see the President as he arrived. Over on the Senate side, your reporter was there this morning too before this uh, Congress was convened to hear the President's uh, address. Vice President Garner was at his office very early, we were told, and was talking about his pecan crop and the bantam chickens in Uvalde, Texas, where he lives. A few senators, including Senator McCarran of Nevada, meticulously attired in a cutaway, strolled about the chamber. And the Senate galleries, strangely, were crowded, although the Senate's only task was to march to the House chamber to hear the President's message. Page boys, who had had their vacations interrupted by the special session, were making very sure that the senators' ink wells were filled and that pen points and pens and such things were in place for a busy week, or perhaps the busy weeks which are to follow. Now the House is sitting there in order, waiting for the president to come in, and we've just received a signal that the president has started down the corridor, which leads directly into the house itself. And we can expect Mr. Roosevelt to come through the door, leading to the speaker's platform in just a moment. At that time, of course, the whole house will rise, and undoubtedly we will hear an ovation from Mr. Roosevelt. There always is one when he comes into this house to speak before the two sessions of Congress. Speaker Bankhead and Vice President Garner are presiding jointly, of course, over this joint session. As I told you, they are sitting together uh, up where the Speaker normally sits alone. That uh, is a marble dais which is in back of the Speaker's rostrum in itself where President Roosevelt will make his speech. Up overhead, the sun is shining brightly through the glassed-in window, and we can see the famed coffin that is the... Uh, speaker for the House Amplifying System, and now Colonel Starling is coming through the side entrance to the House of Representatives, and President Roosevelt can be seen through the door going down the corridor with Secretary Early. Mr. Bankhead has just announced the President of the United States, and here's the ovation for the President. You can hear the ovation. Colonel Starling has just gone up and tested the speaker's platform to be sure that it was sturdily built. And President Roosevelt, with the two committees, one from the House and one from the Senate, is walking slowly up the ramp. Now you can hear the shouts and the roar of the crowd as President Roosevelt starts to walk up towards the Speaker's platform on the arm of Brigadier General Watson, his secretary. Behind him is his bodyguard, Tom Qualters, 
And the two committees now are being conducted off the speaker's dais and back to their seats. Vice President Garner has shaken hands with some of the members of the committee, and both the Vice President and Mr. Bankhead are smiling and saying a few words to Mr. Roosevelt as he walks toward the speaker's platform. The ovation continues for the President as he stands there and now lifts his splendid head to smile at the crowd in his usual manner. He stands there quietly for a moment, and in just, I think in just a minute now, President Roosevelt will begin his speech. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. the distinguished honor of presenting the President of the United States. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, members of the Senate and the House of Representatives, I have asked the Congress to reassemble in extraordinary session in order that it may consider and act on the amendment of certain legislation, which in my best judgment so alters the historic foreign policy of the United States that it impairs the peaceful relations of the United States with foreign nations. At the outset, I proceed on the assumption that every member of the Senate and of the House of Representatives and every member of the executive branch of the government, including the President and his associates, personally and officially, are equally and without reservation in favor of such measures as will protect the neutrality the safety and the integrity of our country, and at the same time, keep us out of war. <laughs> because I am wholly willing to ascribe an honorable desire for peace to those who hold different views from my own as to what those measures should be, I trust that these gentlemen will be sufficiently generous to ascribe equally lofty purposes to those with whom they disagree. Let no man or group in any walk of life assume exclusive protectorate over the future well-being of America, because I conceive that regardless of party or section, the mantle of peace, the mantle of patriotism is wide enough to cover us all. Let no group assume the exclusive label of the peace bloc. We all belong to it. I have at all times kept the Congress and the American people informed of events and trends in foreign affairs. I now review them in a spirit of understatement. Since 1931, the use of force, instead of the council table, has constantly increased in disputes between nations, except in the Western Hemisphere, where in all those years there has been only one war, now happily terminated. During those years also, the building up of vast armies and navies and storehouses of war has proceeded abroad with growing speed and intensity. But during these years, and extending back even to the days of the kellogg briand Pact, the United States has constantly, consistently, and conscientiously done all in its power 
to encourage peaceful settlements, to bring about reduction of armaments, and to avert threatened wars. We have done this not only because any war anywhere necessarily hurts American security and American prosperity, but because of the more important fact that any war anywhere retards the progress of morality and religion and impairs the security of civilization itself. For many years, the primary purpose of our foreign policy has been that this nation and this government should strive to the utmost to aid in avoiding war among nations. But if and when war unhappily comes, the government and the nation must exert every possible effort to avoid being drawn in to the war. The executive branch of the government did its utmost within our traditional policy of non-involvement to aid in averting the present appalling war. Having thus driven and failed, this government must new lose no time or effort to keep our nation from being drawn in. In my candid judgment, we shall succeed in those efforts. We are proud of the historical record of the United States and of all the Americas during all these years because we have thrown every ounce of our influence for peace into the scale of peace. I note in passing what you will all remember, the long debates of the past on the subject of what constitutes aggression, on the methods of determining who the aggressor might be and on who the aggressor in past wars had been. Academically, this may have been instructive, as it may have been of interest to historians to discuss the pros and the cons and the rights of the wrong and wrongs of the World War during the decade that followed it. But in the light of problems of today, problems of tomorrow, responsibility for acts of aggression is not conceived, and the writing of the record can safely be left to future historians. There has been sufficient realism in the United States to see how close to our own shores came a dangerous paths which were being followed on other continents. Last January, I told the Congress that a war which threatened to envelop the world in flames has been averted, but it has become increasingly clear that peace is not assured. By April last, new tensions had developed. A new crisis was in the making. Several nations with whom we had had friendly diplomatic and commercial relations had lost or were in the process of losing their independent identity and their very sovereignty. During the spring and summer, the trend was definitely toward further acts of military conquest and away from peace. As late as the end of July, I spoke to members of the Congress about the definite possibility of war. I should have called it the probability of war. And last January also, I spoke to this Congress of the need for further warning of new threats of conquest, military and economic, a challenge to religion, to democracy, and to international good faith. I said an ordering of society which relegates religion, democracy, and good faith among nations to the background can find no place within it for the ideals of the Prince of Peace. The United States rejects such an ordering and retains its ancient faith. And I said, we know 
what might happen to us of the United States if the philosophies of force were to encompass the other continent and invade our own. We, no more than other nations, can afford to be surrounded by the enemies of our faith and our humanity. Fortunate it is, therefore, that in this Western Hemisphere, we have under a common ideal of democratic government a rich diversity of resources and of peoples functioning together in mutual respect and peace. And last January, in the same message, I also said, we have learned that when we deliberately try to legislate neutrality, our neutrality laws may operate unevenly and unfairly, may actually give aid to an aggressor and deny it to the victim.